How many of you are fishermen? You, you like to fish. Can I see your hand? Just stand up. Just stand up. All the people that like to fish, stand up. Okay. Notice I didn't say you're a fisherman. I said you like to fish. There's a difference. Okay. How many of you guys, still standing, I'm just, it's just for you guys. The rest of you guys take a nap. Okay. How about, uh, how about this? How many of you catch a fish every time you go fishing? See, that's why I don't go fishing. <laughs> Thank you. you. You just illustrated my point. See, the thing is, I, I like to take the grandkids fishing, but I never catch anything because I'm too busy baiting their hooks, you know. <laughs> so that doesn't work. So when I go fishing, I guess I'm a kind of type A guy. I like to get something out of it. You know, if I put my hook in, I'm not going to sit there a half hour and wait. You know, and, and some people have told me, you know, you've got to be patient. Well, maybe that's why I don't make a very good fisherman. Because when I put the hook in, I'll give that bird five minutes and I'm done. You know, I'll go somewhere, I'll throw it in somewhere else. And somebody said, you should try fly fishing. Yeah, I read about that. No, thank you. <laughs> no, you get boots on, you climb in a creek, and you throw this thing out and back and out and back. And still you don't catch anything most of the time. Well, our miracle, we're starting a series today on miracles, three-part series. We're calling it Stuff Only Jesus Can Do. And that's what miracles really are. They're things only God can do, and Jesus Christ is God. But unfortunately, in our world, miracles are often dismissed. Do you know why they're dismissed? Because we have, uh, we have technology, uh, we, we have science, we have labs, we have rationalized thinking. So we firmly dismiss in a culture such a thing as miracles. We, um, we sometimes fictionalize miracles. We have Superman, and Batman, and Green Man, and <laughs> all the other mans, you know. And so we have these guys just doing supernatural feats and our kids growing up. And so when you come to church and you hear the stories of the miracles, sometimes you say, well, man, I got a better story than that. I just watched Superman this week. So we sort of fictionalize the miracles of the Bible. But the Bible speaks of miracles as very real stuff. Jesus claiming to be God shows up on the scene in, in our earth, in our world, and does things only God could do. So that comes to a question for some clarification. What is a miracle? I think I need to clarify this because I believe that this is often misunderstood, especially in our 21st century culture, because the word is used so uh, randomly to describe many things that in actuality are not miracles. When someone makes it through surgery, or someone uh, has something that, uh, that we've prayed for, that is not necessarily a miracle. That may be an answer to prayer, and God may have acted, but not necessarily a miracle. When you find a parking spot in a busy area, you may often say to a friend, man, that was a miracle. It really wasn't a miracle. You, you understand that. That wasn't a miracle at all. Well, maybe God answered your prayer. I'm not saying He didn't, but that's not a miracle. We hear phrases like this, choose your miracle. Every day is a miracle. Claim your miracle. These phrases like these and others are popularized on TBN and, and some Oprah, Oprah Winfrey-isms, Winfrey-isms, <laughs> whatever you call her. What I think happens is that these definitions, these concepts of, of miracles that we assign to the Word cheapen the biblical idea of a miracle. When uh, the religious con preacher on TV tells you to sow a financial seed so you can gain a monetary windfall, and he calls it seeking your miracle, I would suggest to you that that is not in any way, shape, or form connected to a biblical miracle. If anything else, it's witchcraft, it's spookyism, it's magic. I like something Jared Wilson said. He said, the products of these so-called miracles are things Jesus consist consistently warned us about, temporary treasures that degrade our souls when trusted. I think he was right. So what is a miracle? Well, very simply, just 
It's stuff only Jesus could do. It's stuff only God could do. It's an act of God intervening in the natural order of this world system. It means that it's a miracle, it means that Jesus used to reveal a greater truth about himself. And he did it by intervening. Let me give you an example. He fed the, the, the 5,000 miraculously, you remember, with five loaves and two fish, and, he, and it was a miracle that he did. But you remember what he did right after that? He began to talk to them about the fact that He is the bread of life come down out of heaven. And so the idea that every miracle is connected with the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to see that. There's another thing about a miracle you need to know. A miracle, in the words of one man, is an act of turning right side up a world that is upside down. Now think about that. A miracle is an act of turning right side up a world that is upside down. It's when God steps in to what we know as the natural order and does the unnatural, the supernatural. Now here's the thing. What if God is not an interloper in our world, but the things we find so familiar, everyday sin, corruption, injustice, decay, death, these very laws of nature are the interlopers in His world. The real thing that you see in miracles is God setting the world right. There's so many things that are wrong here. And a miracle is like God pulling the curtain back and saying, this is how right looks. Man, does that ever give you a clue to the power of these miraculous stories in the Bible? I know a lot of people say they don't believe in miracles. I've had people say to me, well, Pastor Wright, I do not believe in miracles. As if you saying they don't, they don't exist means they don't exist. It would be like somebody saying to me, I don't believe in the law of gravity. Now, gravity didn't become a law of nature when it was discovered and when you decided to believe it. It's just a law of nature. And you know if you defy the law of nature, you'll find out real quick you'll be a believer in gravity. Jesus' miracles do nothing for those who do not have the spiritual eyes to see them. In fact, the little illustration I gave you about Jesus feeding the 5,000, let me ask you something. They all partook of the food. How many of them hung around afterwards wanting to know more about the bread of life? Very few. So, let me have you remember two things as we get started in this miracle. Number one, the miracles of Jesus in the Gospels never focuses on the miracle itself, but on the one doing the miracle. If you miss that, if you miss that, the miracle is not going to make sense to you. It is a way of revealing Jesus Christ and a truth about Him we need to know and to do it in a powerful way. Miracles were never given to prove Jesus is God. They're given to show that He's God. Jesus isn't showing off in order to gain an audience. He's revealing something about Himself we need to know. Now, that's important for us to know as we study miracles. Number two, biblical miracles are meant to focus on Jesus. They're meant to focus on Him, not the miracle. So take your Bibles now and let's go back to Luke chapter 5 verses 1 through 11 because when I asked you earlier if you were fishermen, I had something in mind for that because the miracle today has to do with fishing. And it has to do with Jesus helping the disciples gain a catch of fish miraculously and uh, showing us something about Himself. So if you take to Luke chapter 5, we're, these miracles the next few weeks by the way that we're looking at all come from the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 5, follow along with me. We're going to start in verse 1. We're going to read down through verse 11. And we're going to, we're going to, to sit back now a minute. And, and this is sort of the biblical TV. And we're going to watch. We're going to watch Jesus perform a miracle. Okay? Here we go. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gisenaret. And he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, it's Simon Peter, 
He asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Oh, Master, Master. I could just see this. I could just hear, Master, you don't understand. We've, we've toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also was James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you'll be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Man, that's some miracle, wasn't it? I mean, think about how disappointing it would be. This is your livelihood. You go out every morning to catch fish. Listen, if you're a, if you're a recreational fisherman, it doesn't matter. If you don't come home with fish, your wife said, hey, what are we going to have for supper? How are we going to pay the light bill? That doesn't happen. Really glad that didn't happen in my house because we'd be on poverty row. I'm not good at catching fish. But think about this. this. This was the livelihood of these men. And they couldn't afford, and I did a little research, if you have a night without fishing, it impacts your budget. So they've been out all night, caught nothing, and they, are, they come in really disappointed. You know, disappointment can really do a number on you. I've just read recently of a, a true story, a Civil War story, where a man by the name of Tony Horowitz uh, heard about uh, a Confederate widow still living. Uh, this was, by the way, she died in the 1990s. He said, well, how in the world could that be? Well, the thing is, she, she married uh, a guy by the name of William uh, Jasper um, Martin. And he was 85 years old when he married her, and she was 20 years old. So that's how she was still living. I don't know the story of how they got together, but I do know a sequel to the story. When he died, she married his grandson. That's truth. They went on to have a family and all of that. But that's not the point. The point that I want to make here is that she was invited by the sons of the Confederate veterans who flew her and her son to Richmond as the only living link to the Confederacy. And they, they uh, said the story about her husband he was wounded in the battle near Richmond, had fought until the end, surrendering with Lee at Appomattox. I mean, man, this was a, this was a big deal. Horowitz, however, thought that name sounded familiar, so he went to the National Archives and he found out that William Martin was drafted in 1864, was sent to Richmond, got measles, was released on a two-month furlough, and went AWOL, never came back. He never fought with Lee. He never was at Appomattox. He never really even saw battle. And so when this came out, everyone was disappointed in the story. It was such a disappointment. Well, that's kind of the kind of disappointment you have with these men. They're veteran fishermen. So they know their job, and yet they aren't able to catch fish. Now, let me give you some context before we jump into the miracle itself so you understand the significance of what Jesus does here. First of all, you'll have to notice that Jesus is the only place in the book of Luke where you see Jesus teaching by a lake. No place else do you find Him teaching by a lake. So, He's teaching by, by a lake, or, or we, they call it a sea. Uh, here it's called a lake of Jacinta. That's another name for Galilee, same, same place. And so, this lake, by the way, is 8 miles by 14 miles in size. So, it's not a big lake. It's a rather shallow lake. But it was known for its, its good fishing. And a lot of people around the shores made their living there. So Jesus is traveling, and He comes to this place, and there's a crowd with Him, and He's teaching them, and the crowd swells to the point there's hardly no place for Him to stand. So he, Jesus looks, and He sees two boats there, and He sees fishermen fishing or cleaning up their nets. After all, every day they had to take their nets out and clean them and, 
and wash them or the way they otherwise they'd rot right away. So this is what they're doing, getting ready for the next night's fishing. And so Jesus sees one of the boats and he knows intuitively that it's Peter's boat. So he involves Peter. And he said, hey, can I use your boat and uh, just push me out a little bit? And so he does. And Jesus sits down and he teaches the crowd from the boat. Now these boats are about 20 or 30 feet long. So there was plenty of room for him to sit and uh, even somebody else or several men to be in the boat. But I like something that J. Vernon McGee said when he read this. He said, every pulpit is a fishing boat, a place to give out the Word of God and attempt to catch fish. I like that. Never thought of it that way. But so after Jesus concludes his teaching, he tells Peter, he said, Peter, just uh, let's shove the boat out in the deep water, let the nets down uh, for a catch of fish. Now, I want you to think how strange this would have sounded, not only to the crowd, but especially to the fishermen. Jesus is not a fisherman by vocation. He's a carpenter. And so here's a carpenter, the son of a carpenter, telling the fishermen where to put their nets. Now, it was a well-known fact that in the Sea of Galilee you caught fish at night in shallow water. You didn't catch them in the day in deep water. You caught them in shallow water at night. I'm told the boats would sit in somewhat shallow waters so the fish could not swim under and around the nets and the fishermen would lower their nets into the water and they'd hang a light or a candle on, or a torch on one side of the boat to attract the fish and the fish would come under the boat and they would catch them. That's, that's what I was told that's how it works. But that simple technique which usually was successful is not successful in their night fishing. Most fishermen fish the night because they couldn't go deep enough out there to get nets around the fish. The fish went too deep. So Jesus did a miracle here. They caught a lot of fish. And He did a miracle not in order to catch fish, but in order to catch James and John and Peter, these guys who were partners in the fishing business. He did it to catch them. And He also revealed to them His real intent was that they might learn how to fish for men. And He didn't give them all this to, just, just to better uh, earn a living. Because at the end, you remember, they left the fish, they left the nets, they left the boat, they left everything to follow Jesus. And there's great significance in that, and, and I want to speak to that in a little bit. Now, up to this point, you have to know that these fishermen had been deeply interested in Jesus. They had heard John the Baptist talk about Him. But remember this, at this point in the story, they haven't committed anything to Jesus. They hadn't committed themselves to Jesus. They were still a little bit on the periphery about who He is. And, and they've seen a few things, but it hasn't really become personal yet. And so here they are. They'd come to know something of His power and His influence, but man, they hadn't committed themselves to Him. I think there are a lot of people in our world like that, even that come to church. You hear about Jesus. You hear about all the things He's done. And, and you think, wow, what a person. And you even think maybe... I mean, after all, I believe there's a Jesus, and I believe in Jesus, but you don't mean it the way the Bible talks about it. You're still one of those curious folk out there on the corner. You're not, you're not denying it. You're not rejecting it, but it's never become personal to you yet. And the Bible requires this experience called the new birth. You must be born again. That sounds very personal, and it is. That's talking about a complete change of life. We're not talking about just believing some religion. We're talking about a transformation of your heart from the inside out. So this fish catching miracle we see here teaches us three fundamentals of catching fish with Jesus. And I want you to see it very simple. Number one, the first fundamental is I think we have to discover the first steps to fish catching. This is in verses 1 through 7. There's some principles here. First of all, in verses 1 through 3, it seems to me very simply the text tells us that there were people who listened to Jesus no matter how difficult their circumstances were. Here's a crowd of people, and the crowd of people in that day were the common people that often followed Jesus, and they didn't have a lot, and they weren't the well-known people. Very rarely did you have the, the rulers come. Every once in a while a ruler of the synagogue would show up, or a few Pharisees would come around. But the majority of the time Jesus' crowd was the everyday people. And they were listening to Him. And the disciples at that time were not yet disciples, or fishermen still were listening to Him. And the crowd was pressing in on Him. I think they were curious to hear about the source of Jesus' teaching. Literally it says here, the Word of God. They, they came and they were, He was giving the Word of God to them. 
And uh, the verse 1, the word of God, circle the word of, that's a word of source, which simply means they, in, they viewed what Jesus was saying as a word from God, as a word. They weren't, they weren't committed to the word of God itself yet. After all, they didn't know He who is the word of God. And so they're looking at, it, at the source, they're wondering about the source of this message Jesus is giving. And they sense the authority of Jesus' teaching here. So, I think the first step in, in fish catching is you've got to learn to listen to the Lord Jesus Christ and have confidence in what He says. And that leads us to the next step. Believe Jesus when everything says just the opposite to you. You know, sometimes when you pick the Bible up and you begin to read a command that the Lord tells us, like for instance, here's one, love your enemies. Do good to those who despitefully use you and mistreat you. Now, man, let me tell you, that's easy to read, but that's tough to do. Because most of the time, when someone wrongs me, you know what my prayer is? Lord, give them their comeuppance. Lord, help them to, help them to pay, because I'm one of your children, and they're coming after me. And God says, no, 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 that's not how my kingdom operates. That's not how we do things in my kingdom. We forgive our enemies. When the disciples decided that the lack of hospitality in one of the Samaritan towns uh, kind of offended them, they came out and told Jesus, why don't you send down fire and brimstone on them, just wipe a whole bunch of them out. Jesus said, I didn't come to kill people. We, we, came, we came to redeem people. We came to save people. And so when someone mistreats us or someone does something they shouldn't do, our first thought was, oh God, how different they would be if they knew you. Lord, help me somehow, some way to reflect you so that the impact of who you are will come out of my life toward them. And you and I know they would be absolutely changed if they knew our Jesus, right? Believe Jesus when everything says just the opposite to you. Look at the incredible words of Jesus. He says in verse 4, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. What is he saying? He says, I want you to do it again. I know you're out all night. I want you to do it again, but this time I'm going to go with you. <sighs> Number two, do it all again, but this time you've got to do it my way. You don't, you don't fish in the shallows like you're used to. We're going to go way out there. And number three, I want you to do it all again because I'm telling you it's my word that is directing you. Will you believe it? Credible words of Jesus. You've got to put it in the fishing context to realize what, this, what he was saying. And then I think of the informational words of the fishermen. Notice in Simon speaks for all of the fishermen there, and he said, Master, we toiled all night. Now you want to circle the word toiled. It's a very graphic Greek word. It means literally to be weary to the point of exhaustion. They didn't have any more gas in the tank. And Peter's saying, Lord, you know what you're asking. Man, we're fagged out. We're, we're tired out. But I don't think we can get, I don't even know if I got energy to get in the boat and go back out there and throw the nets over. He's just being honest. That's where they were. We've been out all night. We've cast our nets out all night. We haven't had any results. We know how to fish, by the way, Jesus. We know how to fish. We've been doing this all our lives. But then look at the personal words of Peter. The last part of verse 5. But at your word... I let down the nets. Now, I don't know what tone of voice he used. I mean, if he's a typical fisherman, and knowing Peter, how he talks throughout the text, you might hear him say something like this. <sighs> okay, just because just you say so, Lord, we'll, <laughs> we'll go out one more time. <laughs> we'll try it again. In spite of all I see, in spite of all I know, in spite of all the odds against the success of another fishing venture right now, and especially you want us to go out in the daytime, out in the deep, and let down the nets? That your word? Stuff only Jesus can do. Stuff only Jesus can do. There's a second fundamental of fish catching that rises to the surface here. It's in verse 5 and then verse 8 and 9, and that is this. I think if we're going to understand fish catch catching from a biblical perspective, we have to capture the heart of a fish catcher. What's the heart of a fish catcher? Well, obedience is one characteristic of a fish catcher. Look at verse 5 again. Peter was willing 
to obey. Now, obedience should always trump our pride. Some of you haven't trusted Christ and been obedient to the new birth because of your pride. You're sitting here thinking, well, if I, if I make a declaration of faith in Christ, everybody's going to look at me and everybody's going to expect me to be perfect, and I know I'm not going to be perfect, so I'm not even going to go down that road, and you reject Christ on the basis of your false pride. Or maybe you're kind of worried, what will people think? Everybody thinks I'm all right. Boy, if I tell people I'm a sinner and I need Jesus as my Savior, what are they going to think? Well, I'll tell you what they're going to think. They already know you're a sinner. You're the only one that hadn't got the message yet. People that hang around you know that you are not perfect. So why don't you own up to it? That's why Jesus sent a Savior. Now think of this context. There's a crowd all around. They heard what Jesus said. After all, by being down out on the lake, the lake would have amplified the sound. And all this crowd heard, and they heard Jesus say, Guys, let's go fishing. Now, people in the crowd knew the trade of fishermen. And I can just see, <laughs> These crazy guys, look, they're going to go out and fish in the middle of the day. Didn't anybody tell them you don't catch fish like that in the day? I mean, it's a little embarrassing. Fishermen listening to a carpenter tell them how to fish. After all, there was no fish that day in that lake. They'd already tried. I think it was a crucial test of faith in how far Peter was prepared to go to trust the Word of Jesus when it made nonsense of everything in his experience of life. Everything he'd experienced was against doing what Jesus told him to do. He obeyed. When he didn't understand the logic or the reason of the command, he obeyed. The Bible says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Let me come back to the born again experience again. Think about that. There are some who cannot put together the fact that one man could die for all, and God would accept that one man's sacrifice on behalf of every sinner who will come. No logic in that, people say. May I ask you if you're willing to believe the Word of Jesus Christ? Because that's what it comes down to. It isn't clever arguments. I know, I've read Josh McDowell's books, and I thank God for them, and I appreciate apologetics, but down the bottom line is you better listen to the work of the Spirit of God through the Word of God that's telling you you need to be born again. You need to be saved. It's not enough to be married to a saved person. It's not enough to go to church. It's not enough to believe that Jesus died on the cross for you. That's not enough. You must believe in Him, John 3 tells us repeatedly. And Jesus warned the religious man named Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And even though Peter is in charge of the boat, he recognizes and respects Jesus' authority over life, over fish, over his boat, and over everything. And so he says, at your word, we're going to go out there. So, one of the characteristics of fish catchers is obedience. They, they obey. And there's a second characteristic I see here, and it's in verse 8. But when Simon saw all the fish that came in, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O God, O Lord. The characteristic that's important for a fish catcher is not only obedience, but number two, humility. Pride, listen carefully, your pride and my pride will never draw anyone to Jesus. Never. If you're, if you're proud, and all of us have vestiges of pride that rear their ugly heads in us from time to time, humility is a sign we really see ourselves as God sees us. And Peter's confession here is a sign, I think, of his humility. And we know this because his confession has four parts to it. The first part is he falls down before Jesus. That's a posture of humility. He, he makes himself lower than Jesus in the boat, both in posture and words. He gets down, he falls down at Jesus' knees, and he says, depart from me. He asks Jesus to depart from him. 
He's amazed at what happened and how it happened, and he needs to have distance between himself and the person who could do something like that. He, he recognizes the huge gap between himself as a mortal man and God in the flesh. Have you ever come to that point? I hate it when I hear songs and read things about making Jesus your buddy, your pal. I, I, I'll tell you, I recoil at that. Jesus Christ is our friend, but He is so much more than that. And if you really want to be a fish catcher, you better be on your knees. The holiness and the purity of this person called Jesus showed Peter what a vast difference there was between himself and this person called Jesus. And when he saw the exhibition of the character and acts of Jesus, all he could do was just drop down to the knees of Jesus and say, oh my goodness, why in the world are you even hanging out with somebody like me? He confesses, verse 3, the third thing here I've seen is he confesses he's a sinner. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Do you know there's the, there's the big rub for somebody coming to know Jesus. Listen carefully. You will never be saved. You will never come to Jesus. You'll never surrender to Him unless you first of all realize and own the fact that you are a sinner. That's the first step. You don't go there, Jesus can't help you. He, he, he can't do anything for you. You have to admit you're a sinner. And Peter does as he recognizes his unworthiness. Now here's the thing. See, Jesus knew Peter. He, he knew his needs. He knew his business better than Peter. And if that is true, then Jesus must know what kind of man Peter is. And the fact that someone may know me better than I know myself is a scary thing, especially if that person is not family. And at this point, Peter and Jesus are but acquaintances. Brian Oaken in his book, More Than His God, card, a book that Nathan put me on to and actually listened to the speaker, said this, Many of us wear masks as though we go through life, hoping no one will see who we are or peer into the thoughts we think. Like Peter, we're tempted to push people away when they get too close. Man, hanging around Jesus and seeing Jesus do this, Peter says, Good night. Why would somebody like this hang out with me? Now, now, Peter's theology was spot on. But here's the amazing thing. Make a note of this. Knowing Peter and everything about him did not make Jesus run away from him. Now, to me, that's astounding. Because there's some people, if I knew everything about them, I wouldn't invite them into my house. I wouldn't want to hang with them. But Jesus knew everything about Peter, and he never walked away. And then Peter does one other thing, his confession. He calls Jesus Lord. Oh, Lord. Now, I want you to understand that at this point in Peter's experience, I don't know that he's convinced of the deity of Jesus at this point. Later on, when Jesus questions him, who, are, who do you say that I am? Finally, Peter comes out. He puts all the pieces together, all the parts together. But right here, I think he's using a term of respect. And he, he actually, this word is the word master. He said, I don't know all there is to know about you, but I'll tell you one thing I know, your master, I mean anybody that can master the fishing business who has never been trained in fishing and could bring in a catch like that, man, you're the master. So he, he took a step here. It's dawning on him that this master rabbi is unlike anybody he has ever known. Now the jury is out yet on who he is, but at least Peter's moving in that direction. Then there's a third fundamental to fish catching that comes up in verse 10 and 11. We have to obey the call to follow the fishmaster. We have to obey the call to follow the fishmaster. Now, there are reasons given here why we should follow Jesus. And let me ask a, a series of questions to help you see why you ought to follow Jesus as the fishmaster. Number one, where is Jesus when this huge draught of fish are caught? Where is He? Well, number one, please mark down, He's in the boat, not somewhere else. At this point, He's not on the shore. Now, there was time He was on the shore, but at this point, He's in the boat, right there with Him. Number two, He's with the fishermen because they're in the boats too. He's determined and promised to be with us. Now, I need that. 
I need to know that, and so do you. If you're going to be a fisher of men, you need that. Number two, the second question, what happens when Jesus does the fishing? I love this. What happens? Well, first of all, the fish come. And oh boy, do they come. Stuff only Jesus can do. He alone can bring the fish. Sometimes God brings fish at odd and unexpected ways. Peter later says, be ready to give an answer to everyone that asks you. What does Peter learn? Peter learns that sometimes God will surprise you by the people he brings across your path ready to hear the gospel. That's why we need to be ready. The fish come and he brings it. I tried to think what an amazing sight that this fishing was that night. All night the men had caught nothing and here they are, they're catching all oh, these fish. I have to believe probably it was the biggest haul of their life. Can't imagine Jesus would do anything halfway. So, here's a curious little question. How did Jesus do that? Did He, uh, did he just, know, like a super fish finder, did He know where the fish were? And said, they're there, go get them. Or, did He bring the fish there? The answer is, yes. <laughs> yes. I don't know how He did it. He just did it. And they got it. The fish come. And oh, did they come. God has to bring them though. Number two, there's another answer to this question. The fish come, but there's a problem. The nets start to break. Now, you know when I read that I thought, wait a minute here. Jesus does all things well. He performs this miracle. In the midst of the miracle we're going to, they're going to lose the results of the miracle because the nets are breaking. Well, here's the thing. The nets didn't completely break. But they were in trouble. And Jesus is on the boat, and so they didn't completely break. So sometimes when you go fish catching, you may have some trouble with nets. That's okay. It's all right. Doesn't mean Jesus isn't going to do anything. We, we, we live in, in, a, in a fallen world, and we're fallen people. So sometimes our nets are going to get a little shaky. I mean, you know, we try to do our best here at church to reach people and whatnot, but you know, we make our mistakes. Sometimes we don't work as hard as we should. Sometimes we're not as faithful as we ought to. Sometimes we don't give like we should. Sometimes we pass up opportunities to witness. Is that not right? Or all, can you identify with that? I can. Sometimes the nets break. Does that mean Jesus says, oh, pfft, so much for you guys. I'm going to go somewhere else. No, I think, I think the incredible patience of the Lord when He's working in the people's lives helps us who falter. But there's another problem. And this is this. The, it was so full. Look what, look what happens here. It says uh, in verse 6, And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. Okay. Fish come, but there's a problem. You need to call for help. You, you can't do it by yourself. The lone fisherman can't handle the fish without the help of his partners in fishing. And I, I wondered, I thought of the parallel of that when we're trying to talk to men. Do you realize when Jesus sent the men out on their mission, He sent them two by two? I, I really believe this, and I believe the Scripture backs this up. There is no one that comes to faith in Christ just because of one single believer in the body of Christ. I believe that there is a combination, people who prayed, people who gave, people who sacrificed, people who actually did the witnessing, people who gave the track, all down the world. God puts all these pieces together. You know why? So that when that soul is birthed, when that person is born again, all the glory goes to God who did it. And sometimes, by His grace, He lets us be there for the birth. Don't get a big head. Don't go around the seminar saying, I can teach you how to do evangelism. No, you don't. Because you know what? I used to try to do that, and I find out, man, I don't know how this thing works. The longer I'm at this, the less sure I am of how it works. All I know is that the Spirit of God takes the most sorry instruments ever and uses it to bring some people to Himself. Now, now to me, that's the, that's the bottom line. That's why the Lord says, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. We're, we're, we're not that good. We're not that good. So the help comes. 
Yeah, but there's another problem when the fish come. Look at the last part of verse 7. And they came and filled both boats. Now, these are 20 to 30 feet boats. These are little old rowboats or John boats. These are big boats. They filled both the boats so that they began to sink. Now, Jesus performed a miracle. You've got nets breaking. You've got overwhelmed fishermen. Now you've got boats that are leaking. Now, most of these boats I've read in history leak anyway, but these were, these were literally being oh, it was so heavy, they're going down. Now, they didn't drown. <laughs> we know because the story goes on. But sometimes when you're fish catching, your boat's going to catch a leak. You may have some problems. Well, that's okay. What a day at the lake, though. God is working and guiding and providing beyond their experience, and God in all His power is present and expressing Himself through Jesus Christ. What a day. What a day. Here's another question. What should we make of Jesus' response to Peter? He says, don't be afraid. From now on you'll be catching men. What did Jesus mean? Well, there's a couple of things I want you to write down, and this to me was so precious. You, you, this is so encouraging. First of all, Jesus meets the needs of sinners who commit to follow Him. Did you ever think about that? Whenever Jesus went, He met needs. So here uh, is what's the need for all these fish? Well, this is how Peter and his, and his partners made a living. They had families. Peter was married. Following Jesus would mean leaving behind their vocation. They won't be able to fish each day in order to make a living. That's been their habit. And if Jesus is going to take away from their vocation, there will be a great need left to meet. And what does He do? He meets their need. Is that beautiful? Is that gorgeous? Jesus knew this. He did something about it. He had a lot of fish to sell. But you know what's even more important? Get this. Jesus demonstrated to these men that He could meet their future needs, whatever they might be, if they committed to follow Him. He said, you watch this, boys. You watch this. You're going to leave, follow me. I'm not a mean paymaster. I'll take care of you when you follow me. You know, sometimes a lot of us are scared to commit our lives fully to Christ. We're so afraid. We, well, if I do that, maybe I won't have enough money to live. Maybe I'll give up that, that, that extra job. Or, man, I want to do this, and, and, uh, and, and I want to go here. And yet, and yet somehow you think, well, if I stay where I'm at, and, I mean, how am I going to do it? Am I going to be happy? Am I going to be... And, you, and, and I want you to think of this fishing expedition that Jesus sent these guys on. He says, uh-huh, guys, see that? I've got it covered. I've got it covered. You follow me. You may not be rich. You may not catch all the fish you want, but you catch all the fish you need, and I'll take care of you. That's what following Jesus means. Jesus really understands what He's asking of us when He calls us to follow Him. You can ask yourself, does He really know and understand the obligations and responsibilities I have. I mean, I can't just ignore my family's needs and responsibilities. I think this miracle shows that Jesus does understand our lives and what we face. Just remember this, Jesus, does never, Jesus never calls us to irresponsible living. He's never going to call us to living where we can't honor our obligations as Christians. Now, we may have some tight moments, and we may have to step out by faith, but look at this. Jesus knows what He's doing. And this is why, one of the reasons I think He says, do not be afraid. It scares the liver out of you to follow Me by faith, doesn't it? It scares you to be in the presence of someone who, just by His Word, can conjure up all these fish. And it's interesting to me that Jesus doesn't chastise the sinner either. He, he calms him. He says, don't be afraid. And then he invites this sinner and others into mission with him. Don't be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. Matthew 4, 19, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. Now the text says in verse 11, they left everything and followed him. I think they understood Jesus' point. Listen carefully. Don't miss this. Jesus said to these men, You've seen what I could do with a bunch of fish. Imagine what I can do with a group of men. Imagine what I can do with a group of men. Wow. 
Go fish for men with the same zeal you did all that other stuff before you came to follow me. All right. We're going to back away from this miracle a minute, and I just want you to think through it with me from a distance. There, there are four concluding thoughts that, that came to my heart and mind as I studied this and read it over and over, and this is the first one. Jesus can be trusted. He can be trusted. Have you trusted Him? His Word comes to pass. His directions are spot on. His knowledge is perfect. Jesus knows people better than they know themselves. Jesus knows how to fish better than the fishermen through fishing was their profession. Jesus knows how. Jesus knows electronics. Jesus knows painting. Jesus knows carpentering. Jesus knows office affairs. Jesus knows all this stuff better than you do and better than I do. He can be trusted. He can be trusted. Follow Him. Follow Him. Trust Him. Number two, Jesus requires humility. Peter knew that he stood as a sinner before Jesus who was holy. He knew that such a catch of fish was only possible if Jesus was who He said He was. And it drove Him to His knees. Let me ask you something. Have you ever got on your knees before Jesus? I'm speaking, I'm not speaking literally, although that's not a bad idea, but Literally, have you ever bowed your life to Jesus Christ? Have you dealt with all the ways of your pride that may be keeping you from serving Christ or loving Him or obeying Him or even coming to Him for salvation? Jesus requires humility. I don't know of anyone that has ever come to Christ that has not first of all swallowed their pride. Because Confessing you're a sinner humanly and emotionally and spiritually is the step God speaks of when He talks about repentance. Repentance is having a change of mind and heart, realizing the horror and the awfulness of your sin before God and turning away from it, and by faith, trusting that Jesus Christ alone is the only one who can deliver you from your sins. Number three, Jesus invites you to follow Him. Are you fully following Him? They left all, everything, and followed Him. Are you there yet? I don't think a lot of us are. I, I, don't, I, don't, I think many of us have pockets of holdout in our lives. We, we say, Lord Jesus, you can have the living room and the dining room and the kitchen of my house, but the bedroom's mine. Or the basement with the pool table in it, that's mine. Everything else is yours, but... Mm. This I'm holding on to. You've got to let it all go. To fully follow the one you say you trust. See, if you're trusting Him, it means you're going to take a step of faith and obey Him no matter how hard it appears to be. And for some of you it will be very hard. But it will be very worth it for the joy of knowing you're following Jesus. And number four... Following Jesus means sharing the good news with sinners. It's amazing that God uses saved sinners. I mean, even though He knows we're sinners, when He saves us, He still asks us to join Him in fishing for people. Are you letting Him do that with you? Daryl Bach, in his commentary on Luke, said this, To be a fisher of people is to be a fish who's able to relate what it means to be pulled out of dangerous waters by the grace of God. Jesus is in the saving business, and just like Fitch, we catch living people. Are you sharing the good news with your friends? Are you going after fish, men and women? Are you trusting Jesus Christ to bring them in? Or, listen, or have you just quit fishing? You've just quit fishing. There was a time in your life when some of you would tell me of stories where you're fishing. You know, you've been out, you shared the gospel but now you've got into a little routine, you're happy with your Christian friends and church and life's going well, and so somehow you've lost your passion for fishing. That's sad. Because if you follow the master fisherman, you will fish. You will fish. 
What does that look like? Sometimes fishing starts with a simple invitation to church or sharing a book or a gospel tract. Sometimes it may mean inviting someone over to your house for a cookout or going with an unsafe friend to a sporting event in order to gain a hearing. Sometimes it may mean taking a meal to a friend or helping a neighbor with a project or cutting his grass. At other times it may mean making things right at home, getting right with your wife, getting right with your kids, making sure that your devotion and passion are directed at them so that it releases you to be an effective witness out there. No man, no woman who has things wrong at home can get it right out there because the home is the crucible where our spirituality comes out in its truest form. So I've known people who said to me, and I remember several, many years ago a man showed up to go visiting with me. I knew his home was in shambles. He didn't respect his wife. He, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't communicate with her. He, he was preoccupied about all the things he wanted to do. And he showed up to go visiting with tracks hanging out his pocket, pocket. And I dreaded that night when he came. Because I knew what it would be. I'd have to follow him around and undo the mess he made in the homes he went. And believe you me, he made one mess after another. Finally, I had to confront him with it. He was a big guy. Boy, he got mad at me. I thought, man, my, he's going to clean my clock. But God protected me. But my friend, if you want to fish, let's fish God's way. Let's follow the fish master who said, get that boat out there. Oh, God, I've never been out there before. I don't think that's the way to do it. Jesus said, trust me on this. Trust me. See, God's way works. Doesn't mean you'll catch 5,000 fish, but you might catch one or two. And when you wake up in glory, aren't you glad you followed the fish master? Lord, we need to be re energized in our passion to share such good news with people around us. Sometimes, Lord, we, we struggle with our fear. Um, and you said to Peter, don't be afraid of this. And sometimes, Lord, we, all our desires and our fleshly interests get in the way, and we want what we want, not even thinking, what is it you want? How, how do you want to use me as a fish catcher? Well, Lord, we're going to have to be obedient and, and humble. And I watched, Lord, as you took that group of rough fishermen, and they walked the paths of this world, and the testimony of them was, here are the men that come to our town that have turned the world upside down. Because, Lord, when you, when you do a miraculous work in the human heart of saving someone, for the first time their world is right side up. And that's what you do. With our heads bowed, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, my heart aches for you. I would, I would love to speak with you about what it means to turn from your sins and trust Jesus as your Savior. You know, life is so short. You're not going to be here forever. And you don't have all the time you think. Death has a way of interrupting us very quickly. And Jesus cares for you. He died for you. But He's not always going to be patient. So come. After the service, we'll have prayer counselors up by the piano over here. We'd love to talk with you. Come. Let us pray with you. And if you know Jesus and you've lost your passion to be a fish catcher, then humble yourself and ask God to help you be obedient and go out with a fresh resolve, not in your strength or energy, but in the strength and energy of the Spirit of God. As you walk with God through His Word, you will be open to be a fish catcher. And just maybe, even this week, God will put a fish in your boat. Even with the heavy strain nets and the leaking boat, it's amazing what this God can do. Stuff only Jesus can do. Lord, help us to believe that and practice it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.